Hi everybody, welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence and we're all set to go against the spread on this college football preview edition featuring our panel of experts here, Andy Gisco from TheLogicalApproach.com, Tony Mejia, a sporting news contributor and playbook expert as well, and Greg De Palma, the producer of the show from Prime Sports Network. And please note that next week on the show, we'll be previewing the 2024 AFC conference on the NFL side of things when that Jim Feist and Victor King will be rejoining us for the show. So mark that down. If you're interested, Jim Feist, Victor King are back to the show starting next week. This week's show is being brought to you by the 2024 Playbook Football Preview Guide Magazine. They're in stock now and they're flying off the shelves, guys. I got to tell you, they're in stock at the Gamblers Bookstore in Las Vegas as we speak. Also on sale nationally at Barnes & Noble and Books A Million Stores. Or you can get your copy at playbooksports.com. Don't make a move without it because a lot of what we talk about here, I'll be alluding to that particular Playbook Football Preview Guide magazine. And with that, I'm going to welcome into the panel here, Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com. Andy, how's your summer going so far this year? You're mute, Andy. I, I believe it's going well because I was excused from jury duty the other day by reaching the age limit at which you could be exempt, and I will look, uh, that age limit of 70 will occur next Monday, and that was going to be the midpoint of the trial to which I was assigned. So the uh, judge uh, wished me a happy birthday, said it'll be the best birthday gift you're getting, and I said, well, there's a downside to that. Well, I, I thought of saying it, but I left well enough alone. I was going to say there's a downside to that. I wish I were turning 50 instead. Nonetheless, that was the start of a good week. The AC is working, and the temperatures remain in the uh, uh, mid-105 to 115 range. So as long as the AC is working, I'm fine. Well, Andy, be glad that uh, you were going to be selected as a member of the jury and not you were on trial, and you were exempt nonetheless. But uh, good news, no more jury duty for Andy Isco as we speak moving forward. I do have the option of serving. I just couldn't this time because of the length and family coming into town for the uh, birthday. I got you. But I think I'm exempt for 18 months, then I could decide. Good. You got 18 months to decide. That's good. Tony Mejia, I know you're eligible for jury duty when and if that call comes. How is your summer going so far? Good summer so far. Busy. Just uh, kind of plugging away. WNBA and baseball have taken up my handicapping duties and did some summer league. My bigger plays all did well, so I'll take a nice streak into the NBA season when that rolls around been writing sporting news has me doing lots of olympic stuff so both women's and men's previews are out there and for my uh my uh consumption of things that i like to watch the uh, olympic soccer tournament began so watching the united states and france right now france just scored and that would normally upset me except that i'm on france so france minus one we're pushing now we'll see what happens the remainder of the second half but yeah and i've begun uh my uh college football work for the season so looking forward to that and then i was i was surprised to see that we've got a uh, hall of fame game right around the corner so i mean it's it's almost like all right here is training camp and then next thursday i think it's uh it's here's here's the game in camp so we'll watch that we'll try to see if there's anything we like on that because i don't like football games that i don't have action in but if there's no action to be had i won't have it but uh yeah other than that things are going well terrific Greg De Palma, Prime Sports Network. What are you doing these summer days? Well, I'm almost done with my NFL uh, research for the season, uh, the off season. So that took a lot of work. Uh, so now, next step is college football. So I've got the next uh, few weeks that I'm going to be diving in head first. I know we're going to be talking college football today, so. Uh, I can't wait. It's a lot of fun. This is a great time of year, soaking up all this really cool information. You know, you hear all off season about all these moves and you even write about it yourself, but you don't really let it sink in totally until you get close to the season, especially now with college football with all the transfers and all the movement and even in the NFL. So, uh, yeah, I can't wait. This is a great time of year. Yeah, it's really a great time of the year. And I know Tony Mejia is pretty big on Twitter and you know, I love tweeting out stats and facts that I'm picking up and learning as we go along the way, getting ready for the college and NFL football seasons, a lot of it coming out of the magazine. And, you know, when I tweet it, I read it and I say, wow, that's something that I would have liked to have known. And that's what we're going to prepare everybody listening to the podcast or watching the podcast this particular week, how to prepare for the 2024 group of five conferences for this particular football season. And 
uh, as we know, uh, there's been a lot of change so far in the college football conferences uh, with the expansions. The Power Five became the Power Four. The Pac-12 practically dissolved for all intents and purposes. And we've got an alignment of new teams inside of the college group of five conferences. The big news for the college five group of conferences is they are eligible to play in the college football expanded 12 team playoff this year. So they're awfully giddy about doing just that. And we're going to help prepare you for the college football season from a group of five standpoint. And I'm going to ask the panel here as we go along here how to do just that. And uh, I'm going to say that I'll start things off by saying the way that I prepare is the same way that I answered before, how I prepared earlier on in the show, by starting with my Playbook Preview Guide magazine. And the reason I do that is because aside from authoring that particular magazine, there's a lot of good stats and information in there to begin your football season with. In particular, I'll start with our four-year statistical review. It helps to find out how teams actually performed the previous year statistically as opposed to a straight up and against the spread. You take, for instance, a team like South Alabama. They improved their stats on both sides of the football last year, but it's a football team that went backwards straight up and against the spread. A team like that will look for this football team to move forward this year based largely on that principle. Then you look on the flip side, there are two teams in particular that improved their record last year straight up and against the spread, but went backwards statistically on the football playing field. That was Appalachian State and James Madison, both out of the Sun Belt Conference. Hence, I'm going to not be at all surprised if I see App State and James Madison go backwards at this particular football season as they're playing a lot on name and reputation. Another thing I look at in the side of the Preview Guide magazine is I take a look at a group of five teams from a coach's aspect, the coach's corner aspect, and find out what the best and worst roles for these coaches are coming into this football season here. And the one thing I've noticed, and I'll share this with you guys is, uh, and I fell prey to this, and it was really the wrong thing I fell prey to, is that when you find a coach that was a head coach at a Power Five conference, a big name coach, and then he loses that job and he ends up taking over a group of five program, they do not meet with a lot of success. And the reasons are probably a plenty. Uh, you know, the fact that those programs don't recruit like they had before in the past. They're taking over troubled programs and they just don't have at their disposal all the talent that they were that used to having before in the past. And you can take a look at some of the names, the big names that were at some big power five football programs before that are now at the group of five level. Tom Herman, former head coach at Texas, now at Florida Atlantic, Butch Jones at Tennessee. Uh, he's now with Arkansas State and Joe Moorhead at Penn State, who's now with Akron. You look at these three coaches collectively at their group of five level where they're at right now and in their careers with these schools that I just mentioned, they're 19 and 54 straight up. That's really rather pathetic. And a lot of people would bank on these name, big name coaches coming to the aid of these smaller programs, but it basically just doesn't happen. And with that, I'll say one thing, don't fall for the likes of Bronco Mendenhall now coaching at New Mexico this football season here. Don't fall in love with New Mexico because of Bronco Mendenhall. It's just not going to happen. New Mexico doesn't have the wherewithal to bring good quality football players into that program. The last thing I'm going to share with you guys before I turn over the panel are the new kids in the block. These are the overhaul of teams that are in new conferences and you know, what to watch for with these new teams as these new kids invade these new conferences. Uh, the welcome mat could get pulled out on them because these players that are uh, in these conferences that have been there and established, they look at these guys as if uh, like they're redheaded stepchildren. They're not really part of the family, but they were brought in because of expansion. You'll find to me, two teams that step out to me this year, Army joining the ACC. I think the welcome mat might be pulled on a team like that. And Kennesaw State, their first year now in the FBS, traveling in the Conference USA. So those are some of the things that I gleaned out of the Playbook Preview Guide magazine to help get me ready for the college football group of five football season this year. Andy Isco, what's your take on how you're preparing for the group of five this year? Well, Mark, it's very similar to what you sort of outlined. I'll just add one other thing that you sort of hinted at, but I don't know that you said it directly. Uh, the way that I'll say it is a lot of these teams that these coaches who are, let's call it for lack of a better phrase, demoted by going from you know, a power five conference to a, a group of five conference is because of the 
increased usage of the transfer portal, they are taking over teams that more often lose players to group to a power five conferences rather than gain players from group of five conferences. They may gain players more from uh, the uh, FCS conferences. So they are losing whatever talent they had and replacing it with lesser talent as opposed to uh, the power five conferences or losing talent to other schools within power five conferences and more often gaining uh, gaining players who are perhaps who were unnoticed uh, when they were being recruited and thus had to settle for group of five status and, and uh, prove themselves worthy of being uh, FBS talent or, or power five conference talent. So I think I'd, I'd add that sort of as a, let's say an exclamation point to what you indicated. But basically I use, I do use the, uh, uh, the playbook preview quite a bit, not just in preparation for the season, but during the season, because most of the questions that, that I want to know uh, relate to uh, how these teams performed in years past. Are they on the improve? Are they on the decline? Are they neutral? Uh, what's their history as far as coaches? You know, is this, uh, uh, is it like a Nick Saban who, uh, you know, uh, at Alabama with, with DeBoer taking over from a team that had a coach for, you know, 15, 16 years? Is it, a, is it a program that has had five coaches in the last 10 seasons? That helps a lot because five coaches in the last 10 years to, talks about a team that is really unable for the most part to establish continuity if you're always changing coaches now that's not always the case but often especially if you're a group of five team you're changing coaches because the coach that you had was doing so well he got uh, scooped up after a season or two yes. at the uh, you know the uh, at the power five conference level so you do have to take a look at that and again if i want to see teams that uh, perhaps returning starters including at plus uh, in addition to the uh, the recruitment rankings that you know the recruitment rankings are opinions but they're respected opinions uh, the returning starters sometimes it's a little bit different and we talked about it i think two weeks ago when we talked about the college in our overview we talked about the fact that you know a starter at oklahoma who transfers to oregon is still considered a starter albeit for a different team so you do want to know what sort and that's in line with the stat that you like to quote a lot mark the returning production how much of last year's production is returning so sometimes the number of starters may be low but it's a lot of production that's returning or you're getting a lot of starters back but the key players are the ones that you lost for example ohio state losing marvin harrison that's a significant reduction in compared to his value to the team and he won't be as easy to replace as perhaps a third string uh, or a third level wide receiver last year who was a starter and has departed and didn't contribute as much so i do a lot of statistical analysis i do read a lot of the preview magazines i, in, I including playbook and you know the national publications the athlons the uh, the r lads the uh, uh, lindy's etc who give good information uh, at least as far as what we can expect the problem with a lot of those publications however is that they're outdated as far as what happens. Say they may be going to to uh, press, uh, you know, right after spring practice, and a lot can happen between them and training camp. So when I get the opportunity and have the time to do it, uh, is I will take a look at the uh, overall uh, sites. Sometimes I'll look at individual colleges if I'm looking for specifics there, but I'll also keep an eye on uh, overall transactions or all over uh, overall news from those major sites that I just mentioned that do have uh, daily or certainly no, no less than weekly updates as far as what may have happened uh, as we're heading into the start of the season. Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com on his overview at looking at the group of five teams as he prepares for this 2024 football season. And Tony Mejia, let me ask you this question here. With regard to the group of five, I think there's, there's, there's an issue going on within the group of five that is perplexing, and I mean it's deeply perplexing it, to the coaches at least. I know Jimmy Chadwell from uh, uh, Liberty made the comment that uh, these teams are forever, it's like they're, with the transfer portal, they're being panty rated. Their mm -hmm. players, whenever they do anything good or they're successful, along come the, the big boys and they transfer over to the big schools now because there's money involved. What, what approach do you take, Tony, with regard to the group of five teams in replacing some of these players? A lot of them have transferred out to either other group of five schools or onto Power Five programs. What's your take yeah, on I mean, that look, that, That's the new normal. I don't think that's going to change. And this is now a feeder system for the bigger schools. I mean, you've got Penny Boone, who was the best uh, running back in the MAC. He's now going to be uh, part of a three-headed monster at UCF. So looking forward to him excelling. But bottom line is, it's going to be tougher for these guys 
to be replaced at their old schools. But then you'll get the freshmen, you'll get the guys that sat the bench and hit the weight room and uh, you study the playbook and will flourish. And then they'll move on to a new school next season. And it'll be a repeating carousel for that. But I, I mean, look, I think all these, all these uh, a group of five teams and conferences we're kind of settling into a rhythm now with what to expect. You know, the Sun Belt is no joke all of a sudden. You know, to me, I think that they, they've really become uh, right on par with the American, uh, especially since the American lost its top programs to a bigger school, a bigger conferences. And then you've also got the Mountain West. Yeah, they're, they're going to do well, but how does Oregon State and Washington State coming in and playing those schedules affect the, 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 that league? How does all the, the coaching turnover affect this league? I mean, you've got Barry Odom barely got there, and he's already one of the more experienced coaches in the conference at UNLV. Um, we'll see what Bronco Mendenhall does with New Mexico. I mean, I, I agree with you in terms of long-term stability. It's tough to uh, win long-term with the Lobos because of you know various factors but you know a, a good coach can probably sneak out a winning season and maybe he'll get out of there at some point I, I did see that he said he interviewed with, with Boise State and he would only would have gotten that job because of his name that that's that's a pretty telling thing and, and transparent thing to, to say about yourself um, so I wish him well uh, and you've got uh, you know even with Washington State and Oregon State, Washington State's got this weird situation at quarterback um, where they've got the big South MVP from Bryant coming in to try to win that job. You know that this has happened now a couple of years in a row where uh, quarterbacks that excel at the FCS level come to FBS. Some do well, some don't. Some transfer out to bigger schools. Uh, so lots to digest. And I'm just getting into it. So, um, but, but very interesting things. You got John Summerall. Um, moves on from Troy to Tulane. You know, you know, Tulane's lost so much talent from what we've seen from them, and they've been, you know, one of the powers of the Group of Five of late. Michael Pratt no longer there. The really cerebral, uh, uh, effective, dual threat quarterback. I think he's trying to make a training camp roster. Last I saw, Ty J Spears moved on the year before that, um, trying to make uh, an NFL roster as well at running back, and really did some really nice things with the Titans last year. So. You know, we'll see what happens here and with, with all these uh, these teams and, and conferences, but certainly there's a ton to digest. I think the one thing, the MAC will make my list last um, because I do expect less waves from them. It really does seem like they are bottom of the barrel in terms of the group of five. No offense there, but, uh, you know, I think Conference USA kind of dipping into that territory, but probably still a little ahead of the MAC, and then Sun Belt moving up, uh, you know, into the American and Mountain West level. That's Tony Mejia, playbook experts and contributor to Sporting News. Greg De Palma, I know we've run a little bit past our two-minute warning here. Any comments you might have about the Group of Five as we move forward? No, actually, the segment only the clock only starts when the segment starts, not when the show started. So well, there we go. <laughs> we still have seven seven and a half minutes to go. And oh, nice, every, nice. Everybody uh, must realize that too. We have a new clock, as you can see on the bottom of the screen. And that's for the segments we have t today we have 20 minute segments the segment times will change every week depending on what the topics are going to be but once that clock runs out uh basically uh it, it no matter what we're talking about we gotta just uh kind of get that stopped and move on to the next segment right now we have seven minutes to go and how do you want to fill that seven minutes out greg anything you have to say <laughs> about the group of five i don't need to talk for seven minutes but um <laughs> uh I think the Andy uh, t uh, mentioned this too, and 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 that definitely, and of course Tony uh, regarding the coaching situation, and I don't think it's all, it, it's important, just as important to talk about the coaches that come in as the ones that do leave. Um, matter of fact, I was going through some of them here, and um, you have to take a look at even some programs like Middle Tennessee. I mean, Rick Stockstill, we've known him at Middle Tennessee for as long as I can remember. And he's finally gone. Uh, nice to see Derek Mason get an, another opportunity. So we'll see. Uh, I thought he did a pretty decent job at Vanderbilt, to tell you the truth. So uh, it's good to see uh, him get an opportunity down there. Um, it, 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 and, and then you talk about also, uh, you know, what are those coaches that are going to be replacing them? Um, and it, sometimes you don't even know who these guys are. Uh, yeah, we knew, we knew, for instance, who... Um, 
like a Bowden was because of the name. But Terry's now gone from ULM, and he's being replaced by a guy that doesn't have name recognition. So somebody might say, well, that's a step down, but that may not be the case. So you have to do the homework there because a lot of times these guys might be might have very successful like high school coaching careers. Doesn't mean they can't be a good college coach. Or sometimes they have a very good coaching uh, record in Division Three, Division Two, or FCS. Most people don't know who these guys are. So I think doing the necessary homework on who these new coaches are is very important, no matter what their names are. Um, and then the other thing too is, is, is the year two guys, because that's usually the, the next step in the maturation process of any program is that second or third year, but definitely year one to year two, you would expect it to be much better. So I, I would take a look and, and, and find out, yeah, you know what, there are some, there are some programs that I think could make a big jump. Uh, like I think Trent Dilfer is going to do an excellent job and, uh, here he's in his second year. And that would be just one of, of several programs uh, in the group of five that I'd be keeping an eye on. So, uh, yeah, I think that is the most important thing in my mind when you're talking about the group of five to me, and that's coaching. Well, there's a lot of new young head coaches that do emerge at the group of five level, in particular uh, coaches that come out of the state of Texas taking over yes. Texas programs Yep. Uh, who were really heralded, uh, highly heralded in the state of Texas. And people don't know who they were, but they won state championships and they tend to recruit real well because of things like that. So it's an excellent point you bring out about looking at these new coaches at group of five level programs and see where they came from, what they did and what their dossier looks like, because it could end up being a sleeper in disguise in that sense. By the way, Mark, you mentioned you were talking about uh, the Brock and Brocko Mendenhall deal in Mexico. And I wonder, because I don't really remember giving too much time at all and talking about New Mexico State before the season began last year. Yes. But what we did know was that they had Jerry Kill. And, and so we gave them respect. And okay, he's been there for a couple of years, so you got to give him respect. Um, and so I wonder whether it's I, – I think you're right, though, obviously. I don't expect that they're going to do much this season. But maybe that's one of the things that you have to look at is, hey, you know what? Brock Mendenhall is in New Mexico. I'm not going to think they're going to do anything. They probably won't this year. But let me make sure I start the research now and follow the program and find out maybe by the end of the year, do you notice that they're starting to play better? And if so, well, that's going to be big for next year because they've got a really good coach. It's a bad program, but it looks like they're improving. So I'm going to jot that down as a note that maybe next year is the year that they can make a move. Yeah, that's a good point. You can uh, check out the pluses and minuses of a team and their maturation throughout the football season and whether or not that new coach has been largely a part of that. And that could dispel the myth about big name head coaches moving down to the group of five levels. Hey guys, if you like what we're doing, please, I'm going to ask you to click on this like and the subscribe buttons down below. If you have any questions or comments, we've got the answers. Simply click on the comment button. And when you send us a question or a comment and hit the subscribe button, we're going to welcome you into the playbook family with a free PDF version of the 256 page playbook preview guide magazine. The one we're talking about on the show here, you can get your free copy simply by logging onto the site, clicking on hitting a comment, hit the like button and subscribe, and you'll get your free copy of the 256 page playbook football preview guide magazine as a special thank you bonus. You're tuned in to Mark Lawrence against the spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. I'm visiting with Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com, Tony Mejia, playbook experts and contributor to the Sporting News, and Greg DePalma, our producer from Prime Sports Network. And let's stay with the group of five guys now, and let's talk about this upcoming 2024 football season. And the big carrot, obviously, here for these group of five teams is the 12-team playoff race that's coming up here that's dotting the schedule and opens up the door for these college football group of five teams to crash the party with a team or two. Uh, the questions I have to ask here coming into this is which teams with the toughest power conference schedules coming in here, when you begin to separate these teams, which teams realistically have a chance to crash the party? And you can do so by starting out looking at their toughest power conference schedules. The good teams with the biggest concerns to me it would be Coastal Carolina for one. Uh, if for no other reason, they're going to face bowl teams in each of the last eight games this football season here. They're going to close out with a really, really tough schedule. 
and it's a type of a time of the season when they really can't afford to lose a football game. So keep an eye on a team like Coastal Carolina and how they perform down the stretch. You've got Fresno State who opens and closes the season at Michigan and at UCLA. So everything in between for Fresno State is going to have to be can't miss because they're likely to lose both of those football games. So they're going to have to not make a mistake, everything in between for Fresno State this year. I talked about James Madison last year, a football team that went backwards in the stats, improved their record. They're going to take on six of their last seven opponents are going to be bold teams this year. You've got a Memphis football program here. That four of their five games are going to be at bowl sites, teams that were in bowl games last year. And one other quick comment looking at the schedule here, Toledo, Tony mentioned the MAC conference being as weak as it is, and it really is a weak conference, and Toledo almost always seems to emerge out of that conference. But they're not going to be a very good football team this year. I know all the preseason pubs are going to have Toledo as a top team or top one or two teams. But take a look and look inside their numbers here, guys. They've only got eight returning starters coming back, and they rank number 122 overall in returning production. I think there's holes for Toledo. It's a football team, I think, that will not be even in the talk when it comes to be college football playoff with these group of five football programs. Andy Isco, your take on what some of these group of five teams might be looking at from a schedule strength of point of view. Muted, Andy. Yeah, I just got to find where the uh, cursor is to uh, unmute it. It just flies across the screen. I don't necessarily look uh, in an overview at the strength of schedule coming into the season because I think that's uh, a little bit more valuable for people who want to make future plays and see how the uh, uh, the schedule is going to play out. So I more take a look at the schedule strength as it unfolds during the season because some of the teams – that were really strong at the start of uh, this year may fade, and more importantly, teams that did not have great expectations. I mean, uh, we talked, I think Greg mentioned New Mexico State last year. They ended up having a, a very strong season uh, compared to uh, not only what was expected of them, but compared to their uh, past history. But I do take a look, for example, you mentioned Coastal Carolina. They just have an average, in addition to the tough schedule that uh, uh, that they have as far as the number of uh, uh, bowl teams that they face, they have uh, about a modest, maybe slightly below average number of returning starters and returning production. So I could see a team like that. Their pedigree suggests that they should be a, a, a very good year, even though their coach is just in his second season there. Uh, they, uh, you know, the, the one thing I, I am a little concerned about is that their record has declined in each of the last few years, but it's still good enough to uh, be eight and five in the coach's first year. And in his second year, very often the coach has more players. He's more familiar with the culture around the program, and he's able to show some improvement. So I could see Coastal Carolina struggling, but perhaps exceeding expectations when measured by record against the uh, uh, point spread. Uh, for another example, you talked about Toledo. Yeah, Toledo does not return a lot, but there's a team, again, with a pedigree of a good, solid program in what Tony has indicated, maybe uh, uh, the weakest or next to the weakest conference amongst the, uh, uh, the group of five, which suggests to me that Toledo will be able to show its improvement as the recruiting talent assimilates into the limited returning talent. And there's a team, you know, I look for a team that perhaps because they do have this reputation as being overpriced early in the season because of what is returning or more accurately what's not returning and then as they show improvement because of the quality of their recruiting which is generally one two or three within the uh, MAC conference itself show you know disappoints their backers early in the season which makes for a good second half of a run I don't remember exactly what the year it was it was maybe five or six years ago maybe just a year or two before pre-COVID, you know, before COVID, when Miami of Ohio, I want to say they started the season 0-6 and, and then won their last six games. That's the situation or that's the kind of situation I look for as a season unfolds. Teams that struggle early and then uh, all of a sudden you can see slight improvement and then it's not yet reflected in the win-loss record, but it is reflected in the point spread record because A, they've disappointed their backers and even if they haven't disappointed their backers, they've shown to be a weak point spread team when a team like that generally has a reason for showing a slow start and then uh, re and, th and then making progress uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the second half of the season. So those are the kind of teams that I look for. I haven't gotten deep into that yet, but with three weeks, four weeks to go actually before the uh, first uh, Saturday, which is I think that one I that one Irish game, uh, Ireland game, and uh, I think there's one FBS FCS matchup. That's where I plan to have everything all set as I work my way towards that. 
Tony Mejia, does do, do the schedule bumps or potholes for these uh, group of five teams concern you? Because we know going in, if they have any thoughts at all, possibilities of crashing this party here, they're going to have to be close to spotless or one loss, maybe two at the absolute most. I think they'll be taking more two loss power five teams than they will group of five teams. But does the schedule concern you with these group of five teams as far as making the playoff goes? Well, I just think it's going to be two categories. You've got Air Force, who I think people respect, respect your track record, look at the schedule, you better be perfect. And then you've got the other category. You've got a Boise State and a UTSA, uh, obviously both established powers. Uh, and UTSA, you know, trailer came, came back, but no Frank Harris. Uh, the the uh, running back is with the Raiders now. Uh, some of the receivers either transferred out or graduated, so I want to see what they look like. And they play Texas. So you can lose to Texas, but if you show up in that game, then you create some buzz and you go perfect in your conference schedule. I can buy you being a, a, a college football playoff team. Same thing with Boise State. They play at Oregon this season. You play well at Oregon, you you know bust through the Mountain West, I can, be, I can see you being a one-loss college football playoff team. Air Force doesn't have that type of, uh, of elite opponent. There are some teams that are going to rise up and probably be undefeated that we're going to poke holes in them because of that schedule. So you you really look at that as far as two pronged. You've got one group of one group of group of five teams in one category um, where you'll be able to get that mulligan, and one group uh, where you won't. All right, good point by Tony here that basically saying that these group of five programs here may not be in all that much jeopardy or all that much trouble if they fall to a, a, a power five con or a power four conference team like a Texas or a team on a Southeast conference. But the trepidation may be not falling to other fellow group of five programs here if they want to validate themselves. By the Very way, good. Mark, I just, yes. I just wanted to follow up on what Tony said because the way that the committee works, we know it's all about the Power Five conferences and the Power Five teams, and I think that we've seen in the past that you almost have to go unbeaten, which includes re winning your conference championship, or at the very worst, end up, uh, let's say, winning your conference championship and have a 12-1 and record overall to be considered to be a Power Five representative. Because of the expansion and because of the fact that we've got you know, a lot of Power Five teams, we could end up, in theory, seeing a 9-3, and certainly a 10-2 and team, uh, t take precedence for the uh, playoffs over a team that, let's say, finishes 12-1 in the point. group of five. Very good point. Greg, your thoughts on the schedules and how they're going to affect these group of five teams when it comes to be college bowl playoff time. Yeah, more to, uh, to uh, elaborate more on what Andy's saying, um, because we did point this out last week uh, regarding the fact that th they made changes. It's funny because when you first start doing the research on this whole new college football expansion, you know, you take a look at all the all the stories and everything that came out, and, and I remember doing that and, and looking at some of these stories. That I think it was like February when all the big changes happened. Well, all of a sudden, during that time that you're doing other things, you're not paying attention to college football, they, they changed it, and they said, well, no, it's not going to be, you know, the, the uh, j just say the top four ranked teams in the Power Five, but you're going to now get the top ranked group of five team, which is awesome. Now, sort of like what Andy said, maybe that group of five team this year isn't actually very good, but they're the top-ranked group of five team. They're getting in. So it doesn't matter now. It's almost like the opposite effect. Before, they used to have all these really good group of five teams, and then they would never get a shot. I certainly hope, even with all the transfer portal stuff, I just certainly hope that there's a really good, at least this first year, uh, with everything on the line in year one, that there's a really good group of five team that would never have gotten in in the old system that gets in, and and we're and we're gonna be okay about it because we're gonna we're gonna chronicle it all season and we're gonna say hey it's okay you know we're not gonna have to complain or worry because these two or three teams that are gonna battle it out, uh, those are the teams. One of those teams is gonna end up in the playoff for sure. They're gonna be the fifth ranked team. They're not gonna get a bye, but they'll play the worst seeded team in the playoffs in round one. And at least uh, they get that, and I think that's kind of cool. So I think that's important to note. Um, and then just taking a look uh, at some of those teams that you mentioned, Mark, uh, Coastal, Fresno, James Madison, Memphis, and Toledo, 
the thing, the, the, the two teams that I'd be a lot more, and, and again, uh, schedule is important, but once again, I would probably concern myself more with the fact that Tedford's back at Fresno, and if he's I'm, gone though, oh, he did leave. Yeah, yeah, he, he's not going to be able to make it. They uh, they uh, named uh, the guy who coached in the uh, bowl game, Tim Skipper, is now his official replacement. Okay, so no well, th- which is well, a shame, but wish him well. His health comes first. Yeah, so uh, immediately they're in the shitter. So uh, that means that only one team out of the five, uh, I think, looks the best, and that's Memphis. Uh, they have stability at coaching. I'm not a big Silverfield fan, but he's stable. And they got the quarterback, Hennigan, who seems like he's been there forever. So um, I, I, I put more credence in that necessarily. That's just my opinion than the schedule, uh, especially the way things are now. Uh, but Coastal, no more McCall. I do like this kid, Vasco. The young quarterback, he showed some glimpses last year. But again, the days of Grayson McCall and Caldwell, they're gone to coach. So that's that's going to be a, something to keep an eye on. I'm not sure Coastal is going to get back to where they were before because of that, but we'll see. James Madison, we've already mentioned it. They lose Signetti. They lost their quarterback. That's going to be huge. And Toledo lost their superstar Mac quarterback and also lost their first-round draft pick, Quinian Mitchell at corner. And a very good offensive line. So uh, I, while the schedule is important to me, I think that is more important uh, looking at uh, certain programs and where they stand with coaches and players and such. So out of those five that you mentioned, I think Memphis is in the best shape. So um, we'll see whether or not uh, that comes to play. Um Mark uh, knocked off for a second, so hopefully we'll get him back here in just a, a couple of minutes. What do you guys think about any of those teams, either that we just mentioned, those five teams that Mark wanted to talk about, or any other teams based on uh, quarterback player coaches? Is there some team right now, and I don't know if it's been too early for you guys to research it, uh, Tony, but is there a team right now or a couple of teams that you're taking a look at? I mean, Memphis is definitely interesting. You mentioned Hennigan. They've got 10 starters back on offense. By the way, I, I think you guys are, are, are both fine because I heard you both. So maybe it's a connection issue between uh, you, Greg, and Mark. But you guys both came through just fine. Uh, as but did as, I hear both. As far as, uh, you know, Memphis, I think the the uh, the American is there to be had. And I think that they were probably the more likely team to have it. But I think because – because Oregon State and Washington State will play these these Mountain West teams, because there are so many new coaches, because we have an Air Force of Fresno with San Diego State and a Boise, I think the winner of that will probably get the nod from most voters. And if there is somebody that, that gets through that schedule as well as, as possible, I think that they'll ultimately be that replacement and be formidable. And I'm looking forward to seeing what Boise is able to do with every returning starter back on the defensive side of the ball. And this kid, Spencer Danielson, he's not a kid, but he's he's a young coach um, now taking over, being the former defensive coordinator, doing a really nice job when they fired Andy Avalos, which I think was well-deserved because he was not very good. And uh, and now they, they still retained that Dirk Cutter to run that offense. So, you know, you, and I believe that they, they uh, grabbed the USC transfer. We'll see if he ultimately wins the job, uh, Malachi Nelson. But um, if he does, he was the, you know, a kid that ended up at USC as one of the nation's most coveted recruits. So I'll certainly you, there's a lot there to like about Boise. I'll tell you a team that I was looking at from the Sun Belt, and that's uh, the Raging Cajuns of Louisiana. They return a lot of talent from last year. It's a third-year coach taking over a program that had a lot of success. In fact, looking back at 2020 and 2021, 10 and 1 and 13 and 1. Then they fell to 6 and 7 when they made the coaching change as a result of promotions, etc. Uh, I like the way that their schedule uh, unfolds. And uh, Sunbelt, uh, we've seen a lot of different teams make their mark in the Sunbelt over the last few years. I wouldn't be surprised if Louisiana is a team that improves itself by uh, uh, three or four wins. Might not be enough to make it into the, uh, uh, the co- as the group of five representative, but I think it's a team that we can see uh, look, look a, lot, a lot better than they did last year and their record suggests. Yeah, what do you think about – first of all, Andy, what do you value more? Because, again, Mark was pointing to the schedules. Um, I pointed towards coach, quarterback, that kind of thing. Do you have a, a side that you that's more important to you when you're going into whether or not a team's going to have success at the group of five this season? 
I, I think it, it's on an individual team basis. In other words, I'll see something in a team that suggests either, hmm, this team's going to be better than expected, or this is going to be worse than expected. Maybe it's the quality of the call. For example, when I talked about the play that I made on Alabama a couple of weeks ago when we did the college thing. You know, DeBoer's taking over uh, for uh, Saban. And we know that DeBoer's had great success at Fresno and uh, then at, uh, at Washington. He inherits a team with a lot of talent. Yes, it's impossible to replace Nick Saban at that level, but if there's a coach that has shown an ability to turn around a couple of programs in recent years, uh, DeBoers is the coach. Now, of course, they're playing in a very tough conference, uh, the SEC, where you still got, uh, you know, Mississippi has a lot of good expectations, deservedly so under Lane Kiffin. Uh, you've obviously got Georgia. a and I think, is a team that uh, uh, will be performing exceptionally well this year. You've got Texas uh, and, and Oklahoma entering the conference. There's still a lot of talent on Alabama, and they're one of those teams, the old saying is, they don't replace, they reload. So the guys who uh, were second and third teamers last well, year... Don't, don't, you, don't you feel differently, though, in the group of five? In or, the group I mean, it's of up five, to you. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I do. No, if you were, oh, yeah. In, in the group of five... I do look at returning starters because of the, the, the transfer portal, and so I look to fade some teams. Like I said, Toledo is a team that doesn't return a lot yeah. because of uh, graduation yep. and uh, transfer losses, well, but they have a proud tradition, a good heritage within that conference that is relatively weak. You go back you know, 40 years, Toledo's been an outstanding program for yep. most of those 40 years. So there's a team that I would look to certainly fade early and not be on early until they show that the the replacing talent is able to assimilate into uh, a program that has a strong history and as i said that's a team that i expect to show progress over the second half of the season in the group of five because they're playing in a conference that you know who are their main contenders two or three teams uh, i coaching is important especially program stability but then again you know if a coach loses so much talent uh, and he's been there three or four years, you have to wonder what's, uh, why he's not able to keep those talents unless the talent that he's losing are going to programs, usually in the Big Ten, the geographic region, going to teams like Michigan rather than, say, a team like in Indiana because they're, they're outstanding players and they're going to quality programs. So it depends on an individual basis. I use the, uh, the Alabama situation simply because of the coaching change and the value that I do place on coaching, especially when changes are made, is a new coach expected to have success? And as we pointed out earlier, you've got a lot more, uh, let's say, first-time coaches getting an opportunity in the group of five uh, that enable them to ultimately prove themselves and move up to uh, getting, let's say, their second or third opportunity in the uh, Power Five conference. And the, probably the best example in recent years I can think of is Lance Leipold, of, uh, who went from Buffalo and in, in a couple of short years has turned uh, Kansas into a a bowl program. Uh, okay, Mark, guys. Uh, hey, guys. We've yes. got the three minute warning coming up now. Uh, before, so with, with the time we have left here, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, you know the the conference USA uh, was just awful last year. Liberty was great. New Mexico State, great story. Everybody else was pretty bad. It was a pretty bad conference to follow. They do get Kennesaw State in. I'm not sure how that's going to work out for the first year. We talked about stock skill gone, but um, and of course kill gone. But is there doing your research? Uh, and, and you do have some t- second year FBS teams like Sam Houston and Rich Rodriguez, of course, in Jacksonville State, who, who actually had a very successful first year. So uh, are there any teams that you notice in the Conference USA doing your research that you're a little bit interested in? Besides, of course, Liberty. Well, I think Liberty is a you're standout here. Mark. Liberty is a standout here. Mark, obviously. can you hear us? Yes, can you yeah, hear Yeah, he's, he's on. No, I can't hear him. Okay. Okay, Greg can hear me, but, I, but uh, the other guys can. Uh, so let me say this, that Liberty is indeed the standout in the conference here. I think it's a real puzzling conference and very, very difficult to have to handicap. In fact, I think all of the group of five conferences are going to be very difficult handicaps this year. Uh, with that, guys, I'm gonna, we're going to put the final segment in play here right now. Before I do that, I want to remind all our listeners out there that if you haven't picked up or don't know what the Coffee Club is, the Coffee Club is a daily e-letter that I send out every day, free, no charge, in your email box from me to you every day. All you need to do is subscribe to any of our publications or any of my services, and the Coffee Club is in your email box every day through the Super Bowl, free on me. To take advantage, go to playbooksports.com, check out our publications or our services, 
sign up for either or and you'll get a free coffee club every day from now through the super bowl with that i'm going to ask you guys go around the corner here and um i know i don't think greg can hear me but if he can't andy if you want to pass this along to greg here i want to ask you guys who crashes the party and which power five conference program is will be deeply disappointed my answer who who's the the team that crashes the party or will make the playoff that has to be memphis uh the uh, aac they should be a one loss team this year their only loss will probably be at florida state early in september they're number 22 overall in returning production rankings and then they averaged 30 points a season each of the last four years under ryan silverfield and the group of five team that I feel will be the biggest disappointment will be Coastal Carolina. Because as Greg mentioned here, they're gonna find out what life is like without Grayson McCall at the quarterback who transferred to NC State. With that, Tony, I'm gonna have hand it off to you. Who do you see being the cinch from the group of five to make the playoffs and who will be the disappointment? Yeah, I mean, look, I don't think there's a cinch, but my chalk would be Boise State. I think they've got a lot back. And I think they're in the most advantageous spot to do it. I'm very curious about Texas State, considering they've been a doormat for, wow, a decade. And all of a sudden, G.J. Kinney shows up. And they what they do last year, they beat – they played with Nevada. They lost to Baylor. and uh, No, they beat Baylor right out of the gate. That was the year before I'm looking at. Beat Baylor out of the gate, opened everybody's eyes. Kinney's dad, and I, I'm, I'm sure we, a lot of us remember Kinney as a quarterback. I believe at Tulsa, but his dad is like a legend at, uh, at uh, Texas. So he clearly inherited some of that. And they're being looked at as a, a, a potential winner of the Sun Belt Western Conference uh, and have best quarterback available in that league in Jordan Cloud. Uh, so to see what he, he's able to do in weeks two and three against UTSA and Arizona State, very interesting to me to see if they crash the party. Otherwise, I think it's Appalachian State show in the Sun Belt. Uh, and so uh, who gets disappointed out of the Power Five? Uh, I, I think I've been on record now, and I think it's up on my page over at Playbook Experts. I'm expecting Oklahoma to take a step back and struggle in year one in the SEC. Tony Mejia with his view on the group of five football programs for this particular football season. Andy Isco, how do you see things shaking out? Who makes the group of five playoffs and which team ends up being the biggest disappointment well first i was looking at uh, jacksonville state and rich rod who did a tremendous job uh last year in leading that program i think they have an opportunity to perhaps be that team especially if they go it can go into louisville in week two and pull an upset over the uh, Cardinal. Uh, that might be the toughest ske- the toughest game on their schedule all year uh, when they step up in class. And uh, the game might very well that determines it is when they are at Liberty in, I believe it's um, early November, that might be uh, a run for, the, uh, for them to uh, make a state because I've, I've always liked Rich Rod uh, as a uh, coach and uh, you know, he's had success with it. I think he was the one who led Tulane, I believe, that had an undefeated season about 20 years ago and then had some issues. Uh, but the other team that comes to mind is uh, uh, Texas San Antonio. The Roadrunners have been a solid program uh, in their time in uh, uh, Division, uh, well, I, I still call it Division 1A. It's, uh, you know, the FBS uh, Power 5 uh, uh, conference. Uh, uh, group of five conference that that level of it uh jeff trailer has been a successful coach there and uh, i like the way that their schedule uh plays out their difficulty is going to be uh their um, third game of the season when they are at texas that could be the one loss that they have they do get to host memphis uh later in the season in early uh november um so I think that they will have a successful season, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's either San Antonio out of the uh, AAC or uh, Jacksonville State out of Conference USA that, uh, uh, that uh, crashes the party. Well, Andy, it sounds like uh, Greg cannot hear me. I know you guys can. So if you would do the honors and uh, uh, welcome Greg back into the show and ask him if he will wrap things up with his, who will make the, uh, the 
playoffs from the group of five and which team will be the biggest disappointment. Oh, by, by the way, uh, Coastal Carolina is also uh, the team that I uh, expect to uh, suffer the biggest decline. And uh, it's just as a question of if everyone catches on and if they are a team that starts out slowly against the point spread based upon their reputation as one of the better teams in that conference. Greg, uh, Mark says he can't hear you, but uh, wanted to know uh, the, uh, the team in uh, the uh, group of five most likely to uh, uh, crash the party and make it into the uh, the college football playoff and also the team of the group of five that you think will be the biggest disappointment this year. Uh, yeah, and then meanwhile, Mark, you should drop out and come back. Uh, that'll make it uh, easier, so I'll be able to hear you. Um, I'll have a much better grasp of what team I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with. Again, as I mentioned before, uh, I've been spending most of my time on the NFL not college football, so I'm not going to be able to give a, uh, you know, a valued opinion either way. Um, so, I mean, what I am going to do, though, is uh, I'm going to, as I said before, I'm going to start really taking a look at some of these teams that can make a splash because I'm wondering whether or not – I know everybody's going to be looking at the AAC and the Mountain West and thinking that one of those two conferences will more than likely produce – the group of five playoff team, but um, you know, you guys uh, mentioned Sun Belt, and I think that's a, uh, that that's really uh, the conference that could end up being the, the surprise team that winds up somebody gets in from the Sun Belt. So, uh, and who knows, maybe Liberty. Um, that's I think going to be the cool thing is is doing the research on the group of five. Uh, because as you guys know, that's what's really fun about college football is if you really do a lot of research and you're doing things that not uh, most other people do, except people in our industry. But for the most part, your average sports fan does not know what's going on in the group of five. Uh, and even the average better really doesn't know what's going on in the group of five, except for those big, you know, again, Mountain West, AAC. So I think uh, it's going to be, a, I think it's going to be really fun to find out whether or not there's going to be a team that's going to be able to come out. Because I think there, there could be, especially you would think that with all these transfer movements, that the top players that are moving from the group of five to the power five are going to be teams from the Mountain West and the AAC. So I, I, I'm thinking that those other conferences, one of those teams might actually uh, be, the, be the fun teams to follow. And maybe uh, we'll get one of those teams uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, make a splash uh, and to surprise people, especially from the Sun Belt, which you guys mentioned you know, Appalachian State is a possibility. You know, one of the things to keep in mind also, it's extremely unlikely, I won't say it's impossible, but it's extremely unlikely that whoever the Group of Five representative is going to be is not going to win the national championship. No. However, if you find a team of the Group of Five that you do think has a realistic chance, maybe you play them preseason to win the conference championship of whichever one of those Group of Five conferences they reside in. What, what, to do what? But play them to win the conference championship game. The conference, yeah. How? Yeah, that's the other thing is that where you where you might be able to get them at a decent price. I would. I haven't seen them yet, but I would imagine there should be some good value in the conference USA because there are a lot of very good teams that uh, you know, Liberty would be the favorite, but there could be a lot of very good teams, and you might get them at pretty decent odds. Because the reason we're talking about which team you think from the group of five is going to crash. You know, you can't really do anything with that information as far as making a futures play unless you want to get the, you know, 300 or whatever to one on a, on a team like that to win the championship, especially since you have to go through several games to do so. But you can make a futures bet on them for the exercise that we're doing here to win the conference championship game at the relatively decent odds. Are, Mark, are there odds, or maybe you guys know, are there odds to, I'm sure there are, just got to find them out, of which team is going to represent the group of five. That's what I'm going to be really interested in to find out uh, what odds they are, because that's the only way you're going to make money. I think off of a group of five team is what are the odds, the futures odds of which team is going to be the playoff team for the group of five. Well, that's a really interesting question, Greg. I have not looked. Tony, have you seen group of five odds to make the college football playoff? No, but I'm looking right now to see if I'll pull them up. I mean, I'm sure the um, conference winner is out there, but as far as the, rep to uh no, i don't have it i don't have it in front of me but i believe it's either westgate or circa that sort of has those odds where you you know you can play like in the nfl with the charges make or not make the playoffs i believe that they have something like that for like all 134 college football teams will they or won't they make the playoffs so if you happen to like say a memphis you can play them at uh, probably decent odds that they will make the college football playoff 
that, there that are, might be a uh, better way than doing the uh, conference championship game, actually. There are odds at DraftKings on to make the college football playoff, and there are absolutely no group of five teams in there, but there are college football playoff odds where there are a bunch. And looking at it, I believe that the favorites out of the group of five at both at plus 400 are Boise and Liberty. You know what's yep. also going to be interesting is these conference championship games, Mark, this year. You know, because in the past, uh, only in a couple of them was it really important. Usually it's the SEC. Uh, which SEC team is going to go to the playoffs, you know, out of the four teams? Now, um, you, you wonder about, I, I guess it's going to be that much more important. Now, like every conference championship game is going to be really important. Well, you know, it's largely from a standpoint of making the New Year's Six Bowl, uh, determining that from the group of five teams. But now this year, it could determine a playoff spot for those teams. Yeah. So, the, you know, the spotlight will be bigger. It will be brighter on those teams that do qualify. So that's a really good point. Yes. By the way, we have uh, 11 minutes and 45 seconds to go for our final segment. For our final segment. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're, we're ahead of the game. Well, well by, the, by the way, I can mention that the um, Circa has conference championships for all of the conferences, Group of Five and Power of Five, and they do have odds for both, yes, they will win the MAC championship game, or no, they will not win the MAC championship game. So you can bet against teams within some of these conferences as well as uh, um, betting on the team that you think will win. Who do you think and will be the- favored, guys? If, if there was odds today, right now, for the group of five representative, who do you think will be like the top two or three? Fav- I mean, you guys mentioned Boise. Uh, I'm thinking it's, it's Liberty. Liberty is minus 200 to win Conference USA. Boise State is even money to win Mountain the Mountain West. So I think it's between those two. Everybody else has significantly higher odds. Okay. Uh, favorites wise, you've got Miami of Ohio in the MAC at minus at plus 230, uh, and Appalachian State at plus 300 and Memphis at plus 220 for the two that I did not mention. So the other two significant favorites in their leagues, obviously the Mountain West more prolific than Conference USA, but uh, Liberty, you know, you're you're minus 200 to win that and uh, even money for Boise State, which surprises me considering the other teams in there at plus 100. And I'm I'm also taking a look at the odds to win the national championship from the Circa favorite is uh, Georgia at uh, three to one. The highest, um, if I'm reading this correctly, if I didn't miss anybody, Boise State uh, is the uh, lowest price at 500 to one odds, which would suggest (laughs) that they have the best chance of being the team to make it in. Uh, Let me see. SMU is 200 to one. one. Wow. So SMU might be... um, Well, SMU is ACC now. That's right. Okay, yeah, they are, they're no longer <laughs> the AAC. So that explains the 200 to 1. So if I did it correctly, then it is uh, Boise at 500 to 1 as the high. Oh, interestingly, the team I mentioned, UTSA, is also 500 to 1. So if you draw the connection between the odds of winning the national championship, whichever of those group of five teams has the lowest odds or the best, or, you know, the, the most favorable odds of winning it, uh, not the longest odds. You'd have to say that those are the teams that are most likely to be the representative. Where, where is that from? The group of five. This is from Circum. Okay, DraftKings has Boise State at four hundred, and then they have Liberty, James Madison, Tulane, at five hundred. So that's DraftKings. Where do, where do they have UTSA? Uh, I haven't seen. Oh, seven hundred. Okay, so they would be the next team after those th- after those top four. They have Toledo at eight hundred, Fresno at eight hundred, and they even have Sam Houston. Well, they have a bunch of these teams starting at a hundred to one. You know, even Sam Houston, Jacksonville State, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, so it looks like those are the top teams according to those odds. If you're going to do it that way, Andy, which makes a lot of sense. James Madison, Liberty, Tulane, Boise, uh, those are the top teams at DraftKings. You know, guys, look inside the uh, Playbook Preview Guide magazine in our conference previews, and every conference is broken down also with their projected season win totals and their odds to win the conference. 
And you can take things backwards by doing just that and taking a look at which of these group of five teams has the season highest win total. That would be Liberty, 10 and a half wins out of the Conference USA. Then you've got Memphis at nine and a half wins out of the AAC. Boise's eight and a half wins out of the Mountain West. You can take that for a starting point, but you also have to be subjective about the fact of who the competition is that they're yeah. playing. Uh, you know, right. Toledo's in there uh, eight or seven and a half or eight and a half, but they're in the MAC. Uh, so for Liberty to be sitting at ten and a half, it means they're not going to be plowing through a lot of opposition, which is likely most likely to make them the odds-on favorite to be the most likely team to be favored to make the playoffs from the group of five. Yes. Yep. Uh, by the way, Mark, uh, Liberty is playing a 13 game schedule and the only like really tough game that's on their schedule based on last year's teams would be Appalachian state on the road. And we know how good they were last year. I- I'd be shocked if again, it's early, but I'd be shocked if they didn't at least, I mean, what, lose one game maybe with that schedule? So I think ten, over 10 and a half would sound really good because they get their quarterbacks back. The coach obviously is back. Now they have lost players, but for the most part, when you bring 14 players back in your quarterback from a team that was just so much better than every other team in that conference, that seems like it's almost too easy. Well, you know, they've got two losses to play with there. Yeah. You know, which, you know, looks to be like a, a reasonable number to play with with them. But, you know, they're also it's a it's the conference of all the group of fives that probably has, I think, the, the fewest amount of participants, uh, the Conference USA, uh, the, the shortest amount of participants. So can they plow through that conference? Probably so. Probably. Yeah. Yes, probably will. How long? But, I mean, how much longer can they stick in this conference if if they do this for another couple of years? I mean, at some point, it's going to be like, come on, you got to get out of here. You're just too good. It's just, it's, I don't even know what they're doing in here, to tell you the truth, that we already know, even before they realigned this, that they were going to be much better than these other programs. Well, I mean, they have money. That's all it is. They have a lot of a lot more money than most people do. In that yeah. And all people, than everybody else, in that league, and then a lot of people do in the South. It was, the, that, it was huh? the conference that uh, has really arguably met with the most upheaval as far as changes goes over the course of the last 10 years. There have been so many people going in and out of the Conference USA. It's shrunk to the position where it is right now. So who knows where it will be, if it will even be in existence next year or the year after. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, look, they, they, they have that a tough game at Appalachian State, and then presumably Sam Houston State's going to be pretty good so they play them on the road in the final game of the sure. season before the – Conference USA Championship game. Yeah. But again, I think, yes, I, I, that's probably why it's chalky. That's what minus 200 looks like great value, if you think about it, to win that league. And uh, and then you you just have to stack resumes at that point. Whoever the wins the Mountain West, if they do so with one loss, will have a better resume than Liberty. But if Liberty's undefeated, probably can't deny them because the Appalachian State win should be pretty good. Simple yes. And, and again, it's all going to be ranked where you're ranked. By the way, uh, you guys, well, Mark, you're down there. In, well, I know you're in South Florida. Tony, you're in what, Central Florida? Yeah, North Central. So um, what, what do you think about this year being a breakout year, not to win the conference, but a breakout year for FIU? You know, this is year three for McIntyre. This quarterback that they have is a really talented kid that yeah, got his sure. feet wet last year. Do you, can you see them making like a, you know, a, a big move this year? Tony? You, they should. I mean, Miami high school football is on par with most everyone in the country, including California and Texas. I'd give both of those states the the nod there. But in South Florida, I mean, they take their, their high school football really seriously, and uh, it's the best in the state, you know, by a lot. So, you know, you, get, you got your South Ridges and your Palmettos and all of them. So... From that standpoint, they should be able to get the recruits that your Miamis and you know your big bigger Florida schools don't get. Uh, and now Florida Atlantic is slightly higher than FIU because of where they play, but still I mean, there's enough talent for everybody down there. So yeah, McIntyre should be able to elevate the uh, the Panthers to the number two status behind Liberty in that league. I, I mean, agree wholeheartedly with what Tony says. You look at this team here. 
Uh, their schedule's not much. Only three teams that are in their schedule were in bowl games last football season here. Talk about returning production ranking. They rank number 34 in the country. And Mike McIntyre has done, as you said, Greg, a nice job with this football program here. When he inherited them, they were a one-win team. They've won four games each of the past two football seasons in a row. Uh, the offense went backwards a little bit last year, but the defense toughened up here. And I think this football team could be a mini surprise inside the Conference USA. By the way, the uh, concern that I have for Liberty, they might, they could go unbeaten. They could lose out to a one-loss group of five team who has a win over a Power Five opponent, especially if it's a decent one. But Liberty oh, does not. Liberty does not have any games against Power Five teams this year. No, and and I'm sure they tried to schedule them. I would guess. Oh sure. But that's the thing that eventually we hope uh, will also get straightened out. Uh, especially now, I think these big programs are not going to feel the like, oh, well, I, I, we're not going to give this team a shot at us. And I'm not talking about the Alabamas of the world. I'm talking about those mid teams in these power conferences because they're afraid that, well, what if we lose to this team? How that could affect us? Well, it shouldn't affect you as much anymore. Uh, so um, I hope that's the case. I hope they give it's, the benefit of the doubt. Especially if you say it's a middle team, let's say in the Big Ten, where say a loss by, uh, let's say uh, Illinois, if they lost to uh, that uh, uh, a team like Liberty, yeah, it might be their fifth loss of the season instead of just four. Yeah, what a great season they put together last year, guys. Thirteen to one, they won their first thirteen games. They won the yard stats in all three, all thirteen of their first games of the football season here. They were indeed head and shoulders the best Group of Five football program last year, and they're going to be targeted this year. Uh, and that's the reason that they do have the highest season win total and a great point, as Greg mentions here, a 13-game schedule, which might help them attain that 10 and yeah, a half the, uh, I, I didn't. Where's their 13th game other than the championship game? So I only show 12 for Liberty. Uh... But, um, but the, the, the other concern is they were embarrassed by Oregon in their bowl game, and that might cause some... Uh, if, if it's coming down to Liberty and one or two other teams, the committee might say, look what happened last year when this team, which had that great unbeaten season, went up against a uh, legitimate Power power 5 uh, team. Well, actually, no. I mean, even though there was 12 on the schedule, I was already counting their championship game. That's the why championship I said 13. Yeah. By the way, Boise's, Boise's got the Oregon game. So on one hand, right. they've got a really good yeah. <laughs> program. But on the other hand, if they get annihilated, uh, which could happen, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look bad. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, but, but that, that's what I mentioned is you, you have these opportunities from yeah. these teams, your Fresnos, your, your Boise's, your Memphis's. Memphis has a, has a top power five on their slate where if you show up and you play well, that stays with you as a vote. For, and forever, for what it's worth, Boise, and, and Liberty does not. Boise does play Oregon the week before Oregon plays at Oregon State. It's not a conference game anymore, but it's still a, yeah, rivalry, it's a rivalry game. Yeah. So Boise, you know, Boise might be able, you know, if they lose the game 28-25, uh, especially on the road, that might not be critical to them, you know, if they end up, let's say, winning all their other games, conference and non-conference. By the way, our time is up for the segment, uh, even though uh, there's tons more to talk about, but that's what the clock is for, is to shut us up, because we've got, uh, what, we still have uh, about six weeks before the season begins, five weeks? Yeah, we got a lot of clock time between now and the start of the football season for sure. <laughs> this was a good show, guys. I want to thank you for joining us in on the show this week. And remember, as I mentioned at the beginning, next week, NFL conference preview. We're going to start with the AFC. Jim Feist, Victor King will join us for the show. Be sure to tune in next week. And also be sure to subscribe and hit the like buttons down below and get your free copy of that Playbook Football Preview Guide PDF magazine. You'll be glad you did. Until next week, once again, for the crew, and the experts here on the show, this is Mark Lawrence reminding you to always to remember to bet with your head, not over it, and good luck as always.